elections around the corner and in the run-up to the parliamentary polls, we thought of talking to candidates to find out what policies their respective uh, parties uh, promise to deliver uh, if they are elected to power. Uh, of course, to discuss all this, uh, policy, economy and the way forward for Sri Lanka too. I've invited to our studios um, Colombo District candidate for the Samagi Janabalavega, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, former Deputy Minister of Policy Planning and Economic Development, former Non-Cabinet Minister of Economic Reforms and Public Distribution, as well as the former State Minister of National Policies and Economic Affairs, Dr. Harsha De Silva, an economist yourself. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we start questioning you, I, I'd like to ask you what you have to say um, about the run-up to the election. Now, we see a lot of changes happening in Sri Lanka um, in line with the challenges that the entire world is facing surrounding COVID-19. Uh, but at the same time, Sri Lanka faces many other challenges too. But what is your observation for Sri Lanka as an economist? First of all, thanks for the invite. Pleasure to be here. Um, you know, the road ahead is going to be tough. No matter who's going to get elected, uh, things are not going to be easy. Uh, challenges will be enormous, uh, particularly because of the downturn in the global economy. Uh, countries are showing negative growth. Uh, but we see some pickup in certain uh, areas. Um, so we have to navigate this ship really carefully uh, because this is, these are stormy seas um, and uh, we have to all work together. Uh, think of Sri Lanka after the elections and um, figure out how best uh, to make uh, you see the right calls, uh, support each other uh, because we need to somehow uh, you know, clear the storm, weather the storm. Uh, so it is a challenge. So as an economist, um, I see many, many uh, complications uh, that we will have to face going forward. So when you say complications and uh, a storm in terms of uh, the country uh, economy, uh, country's economy, what does this mean? Is this based on policies Sri Lanka has taken? Or is this uh, in the midst of the global challenges uh, that, uh, the, uh, that countries face uh, together? You see, not every country is going to feel the pain the same. Some countries would come back up faster than others. It all depends on how strong the country was before it entered the storm. Here I mean the coronavirus situation. Unfortunately, we were not in a, uh, a good position to start off with. Uh, we were already uh, you know, in difficulty. Uh, we were running what we call twin deficits, one internally where we cannot bridge our deficit locally. We spend a lot more than we earn in terms of uh, you know, the revenue to the state and the expenditure. So we've been running deficits uh, for a long period of time, except uh, during the last uh, two years, uh, 2017 and 18, uh, Mangala managed to show a a surplus in the uh, the current account of the of the the budget. Um, that is, once you take out interest payments, the expenses were less than revenue. Uh, then, on the external side, we've been running a balance of payments deficit. We've been running trade deficits for a long period of time. Current account has been in deficit. So these are twin deficit. One is, um, like I said, you know, that has to be resolved locally. Uh, and the other one is uh, the external deficit, which has to be resolved externally. Uh, you talk about um, former Finance Minister Mangala Samaravira's uh, tenure. But uh, it was during this time that Sri Lanka uh, experienced uh, one of the lowest uh, growth rates, GDP growth rates, 2.2%. Uh, and this was only second to the lowest Sri Lanka faced in 2001, uh, that is 1.5%. But this uh, 
as you see, is during the time that you were a prominent figure in of the government. Course, of course, that, that is true. Uh, in fact, uh, the growth hit 9.1% uh, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Soon after the war, there was a lot of activity, a lot of debt fuel construction, um, and both the North and the East came on stream. Uh, but what happened in 2013, during Mr. Rajapaksa's government, the growth rate fell from 9.1 to 3.5, to 3.5. Was that, uh, wasn't that due to the rebasing of GDP figures? Absolutely not. Every five years or so, the GDP has to be rebased. It is nothing political. Uh, what it is, is uh, when the structure of the economy changes, you've got to move with the new structure. For instance, new services have come on stream. Uh, those new services have to be accounted for. So you can't think of a structure that existed in 1975 and try to estimate the GDP in 2020. So every country uh, rebases its uh, the, the GDP calculation. Some countries do it annually, some countries do it every three years, some countries do every five years, and we used to do it every five years. And so uh, it will be uh, done again in 2020, right? So these are technical matters, but it fell to 3.5. But again, uh, how, let how me, do you explain, me, how do you explain let me, that let me finish. fall? Yes, let, let me finish. Well, if you can also add to the, the reasons surrounding the fall. Uh, yeah, that is, that is why I said it was a debt-fueled construction-led growth, mm -hmm. right? So those have limits, right? There are so many highways you can build and so many ports you can build in a given period of time. Uh, and uh, the the structure uh, wasn't sustainable, you know. The the, the it was a it was a um, a balloon that burst uh, because in economics, like in any other uh, science, right? There are uh, you know equations that you need to look at. So you can't just wish the economy to grow. It doesn't happen like that uh, unless you are able to create efficiencies, create competitiveness, create. Uh, growth uh, in a sustainable manner, growth will not last. So what I was planning to say is, okay, it fell to 3.5, it rose to 4.5 and 5, and it has been at those rates, 4, 4.5, 5 in that region. But unfortunately, we had uh, the 2018 October coup. With that, uh, the budget was not presented till April of 2019. And then soon after that, there was the East uh, bombs. That sort of shattered the economy. Uh, tourism went down, trade went down, and we all saw economic activity fell. And with that, we registered a 2.5% growth. Of course, nothing to be happy about. But the point I was making is that given all of that, not 2019, I said 2017 and 18. Um, Minister Mangal Samarivar was able to show a uh, 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 surplus in uh, the primary uh, account of the budget. Uh, when you say there was um, the, uh, the 2019 year, it was marred by a lot of challenges. Um, again, uh, I hear you speak a lot about 2020. Mm. Now, mm. the current situation, mm. you keep saying that Sri Lanka is heading into a crisis, mm. an economic crisis, but um, alongside other countries, we are faced with a global challenge. So should we not look at 2020 also the way you see 2019? Because 2019, there was no food crisis. Crisis. There was no oil crisis. There was no uh, international crisis that marred uh, any growth in Sri Lanka. Yes, that's right. But it was an internal issue in 2019. So now we have an internal issue plus an external issue. Uh, from what I understand, growth in the first quarter of 2020 is minus, not plus, minus. And that is, um, you know, for the first quarter. And uh, I have been questioning the government, why uh, is it that the numbers have not been released? Every year, every quarter, uh, the Department of Census and Statistics issues the growth figure 75 days after the end of the quarter, right? So excuse after excuse is being given. Uh, I challenge the government to show the growth figure for 2020 first quarter. And you can't use COVID-19 for that because the country shut down only on, I believe, the 20th of March. And we are talking about the time period from 1st of January to 31st of March. And what I hear uh, from internal sources, it is minus or negative growth. 
We'll take a short break at Hyde Park to return in conversation with Dr. Harsha De Silva. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. Uh, you were talking about uh, your predictions for Sri Lanka's uh, growth figures. Um, what would you have done different in the first three months of this year if you say that Sri Lanka, um, yes, there is a global uh, crisis, but that Sri Lanka should have managed things differently? No, I'm not referring to the global crisis here. I'm referring to the unwise decision of President Rajapaksa in uh, December of 2019 where without any uh, sort of serious study, uh, taxes were uh, changed. Uh, VAT was reduced from 15 to 8 percent, uh, ESC was taken out, uh, pay tax was removed, income taxes were lowered and so on. Uh, with the hope that uh, people would benefit on the ground, uh, assuming cost of living would go down and so on. But that didn't happen. All what happened was that the Treasury uh, started receiving less and less cash. We had predicted that the cost of this uh, revision of taxes would be in the region of 300 to 400 billion, with a B, billion uh, rupees. But now, with coronavirus hitting on top of that unwise call, uh, we are seeing, uh, economists are predicting, that the shortfall in the Treasury would be in the region of 500 billion rupees. That is perhaps a quarter of revenue. So when you are already in a hole where your revenue is not sufficient, that is what I started out by saying that we are running a deficit internally, meaning the revenue was not sufficient to sustain the expenditure. And when you cut revenue and say, look, we don't need this money, you're going into a hole that is created uh, by the unwise decision of this government. So therefore, um, the, uh, the, the problem needs to be resolved there. You're referring to the stimulus extended by the government uh, in 2019, November of 2019. Again, um, the Samagi Jana Balavega and your leader, Sajid Premadasa, uh, pledges to um, hand 20,000, up to 20,000 rupees of um, relief to uh, underprivileged families, and that will amount to about 5 million families, amounting to 100 billion again. Uh, 1.2 billion is the size of the fiscal revenue of Sri Lanka. So don't you think that will also be uh, an unwise decision if you and your party are elected uh, to power? Let me correct those figures. Whoever gave you didn't know how to calculate it. Uh, let us look at the figures, right? Uh, we have um, 8 million people working, okay? Of the 8 million people working, 2.7 million people are self-employed uh, and 1.6 million are basically laborers. You know, they earn their daily wage. Uh, so there you have about uh, 4.3 million people, okay? Of the 4.3 million people, let us assume uh, that half of those people need to be paid 20,000 rupees, right? Uh, and then that 20,000 rupee, uh, 20, rupees into, uh, into half of those people, let's say 2 million people, uh, works out to about 40 billion rupees, right? So I don't know where you got the 100 billion, it will come to about 40 billion, okay? Now compare 40 billion with 400 billion, that is the minimum the government is going to lose because of the unwise call of uh, November 19, uh, sorry, 2019. But will the, will the economy be able to sustain let, let me finish. What is the economy? <laughs> the economy uh, means the people, right? People are suffering. People are unable to work. I don't know about this institution. Many institutions have let people go or said, look, you know, you work part time and so on and so forth. Uh, thousands upon tens of thousands of people have lost their jobs. So what is the responsibility of the government to ensure that people are able to survive? Now let me finish. The Department of Census and Statistics every month puts out what's called the poverty line. What well, the poverty line means, uh, the ability or the inability uh, to spend sufficient money per month to put in your body 2,030 kilocalories a day. And without 2,030 kilocalories a day, you are categorized as being poor. That means unable to make ends meet 
purely just to have your food. So it is the responsibility of the government to ensure that people are above that, that people are able to buy their, uh, uh, what do you call, groceries uh, to survive, right? So that is how uh, this amount is arrived at. So the amount needed for a person is 5,040 rupees a month. So given that there are four people on average in a family, that's how the 20,000 is, uh, is um, arrived at. So nobody is saying every family needs to be given 20,000 rupees forever and ever. All what Sajit had said is those people who are suffering due to the coronavirus crisis, uh, in order to meet the minimum basic requirements of survival, uh, needs to be uh, given up to 20,000 so rupees a day. So are you saying the, the, the present uh, government, the present setup has not done sufficient enough to uh, relieve the people of their burden, of, of, the, um, of the difficulties they face due to this crisis? When we see, again, I refer to the global crisis, where jobs have been taken off, people um, are unemployed, and this is not just uh, something that Sri Lanka is facing. We, we, we are not, somebody once said, you know, th that they were not trying to run some other country's economy, they were trying to run Sri Lanka's economy. You know, forget about other countries. But are they but able to, uh, are they doing, aren't they doing their maximum in the given situation? If you say Sri Lanka uh, does not have revenue, we, we have burnt out on our revenue streams. Yeah, it's all about priorities. You know, what is our priority right now? Is it building a cricket stadium in Hamadota? Or is it retiring some road in, uh, sorry, Homagam? Or retiring some road in Hamadota? No, it is making sure that the people are able to survive during this crisis. Right? So, other countries are taking care of their people. I mean, even in America, people are, everybody is getting a check for $1,250, right? So, so, the issue is reprioritizing, right? What is the most important and urgent need for the people during this crisis? You know, this is about us. This is not about some other country. Yes, the whole world is facing problems. Nobody is denying that. Our people are facing a crisis. So if the government is able to give tax relief to the rich people to the tune of 500 billion rupees, why can't the government give 40 billion rupees to the poor people so that they can survive? Tell me why not, right? And tell me if uh, the priority is not there. The priority is right there. So I am very critical on a policy matter. <laughs> Uh, of, of the government's handling of the situation from an economics perspective. From an economics perspective, again, if you go back to 2015, the government of good governance, you a key uh, stakeholder in that government. Um, we look at you as an economist, a contributor to policy making. But again, we saw that the country plunging into further debt. We saw um, lack of policy continuity. And also, there was a lot of... Um, uh, issues faced by the people where they complained that there was n not enough uh, relief. So how did, how did uh, this government go wrong? Yeah, so good question really. I mean, I'm not denying that the previous government got uh, into a fair amount of debt. In fact, the central bank, uh, if you look at the monthly report, actually the weekly report that comes out every week, look at the last one, and you will see that uh, the debt the government's debt uh, had increased by something like 6,000 billion rupees in the uh, 60 months, okay? 6,000 billion, that's a, that's, that's, that's a significant amount. But if you look at how much the national debt increased in the last four months, four months, 1st of January to the end of April, it's 1,000 billion, 6,000 billion in five years, 1,000 billion in four months. Now you tell me uh, whether, uh, you know, the, the new government uh, is doing justice to that uh, issue. No. I mean, just take the comparison. I'm not saying, you know, take an average monthly uh, debt and multiply that by the remaining four years and four months of this presidency. But seriously, there is a problem. Uh, there's no point in blaming. One needs to figure out what the issues are and then try to come up with solutions to these issues. Uh, debt stock, external debt um, increased uh, by seven trillion 
this was during the past five years, past in sense from 2000. Six trillion. S uh, closer to seven trillion. No, six trillion. Uh, right. We'll go with six trillion, yeah. as you say. I, I, yeah. I trust <laughs> your yeah, <laughs> estimates yeah. and statistics. Yeah. But at the same time, this was at, in 2015, you were very critical of the government, the, the previous government, um, saying that they mismanaged the economy. And this is the message you sent to the international world. But still, you went and borrowed at 7.87%. 5%, which was higher than 6.85%, which was uh, the previous borrowing rate. But how do you justify this? That's pure bankam, right? I say bankam because whoever gave you those figures need to understand how you price a, 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 a debt, right? You price a debt depending on what the market rates are. And you look at what the treasury uh, bill rates are or risk-free rates are. Uh, what is the US government's five-year rate or whatever, and then you add a risk premium on it, right? So the risk premium is what you need to look at. Is the risk premium going up or going down? So if global rates are 5% and the risk premium is 2%, then it is 7%. But if the global rates are 2% and the risk premium is 5%, then it's again 7%. But the latter case is far worse than the former case because but in the form, me. let me let me let me let me finish right. In the former case, the risk was only two percent. In the latter case, the risk was five percent. So you have to compare apples to apples. You can't compare apples to pineapples, right? So the issue is, you said yes, six trillion. And what I'm saying is, in the last four months, a thousand billion is one trillion. In the last four months, this government borrowed one trillion. The last government borrowed six trillion in five years. This government borrowed one trillion in four months. Before we talk about the one trillion, the six trillion borrowings, how do you justify that? Why you have to pay back, no? I mean, it is not when, when you came to our face, right? It, 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 it flows from one government to another. But there was very, uh, there, there wasn't significant development uh, happening in the country um, because I remember back in the day, you did say that development was misguided and uh, that Sri Lanka, again, did not prioritize uh, at the time. But during your uh, regime, there was very little development happening, so which is why I ask you how you would justify uh, that, that kind of borrowing. I mean, I don't know how you can say very little development. You, you have to measure it. You know, it is one thing to just say things. But when you say very little development, what do you mean? You got to look at how many road kilometers were built, right? How many highway kilometers were built? You know, how many road uh, water projects were done? Right, how many schools were built and so on and so forth, right? So if you say very little development took place, I completely, uh, you know, don't agree with you. I disagree with you in totality. But the external debt is essentially, uh, we have to roll over the debt. Meaning, uh, you know, it was only in 2007, the first ISBs were issued. Uh, that means international sovereign bonds were issued. Until that time, we used to borrow at quarter percent, one tenth of one percent and so on. But in 2007, we started borrowing at 8.75 percent. The highest ever borrowing rate for Sri Lanka on a US dollar uh, uh, debt was 9.75 percent. And that was not during our time. That was during Mr. Rajapaksa's time and that was done through the Na uh, National Savings Bank and so on. The, the fact of the matter is that you got to use the money that you borrow wisely, right? I'm not saying one mustn't borrow, right? Everybody has to borrow. That's how the economy works, right? But whether we are in office or somebody else in, is, is in office, we are a sovereign, right? So we can't say the previous government borrowed, so therefore we are unable to pay. Whoever borrows, the next <laughs> set of people will have to pay, right? So if we borrow, they have to pay. If they borrow, we have to pay. If this, uh, if, if governments change, that is the way the world works, right? So therefore, uh, like I said, whatever we borrow must be put to good use. We'll, we'll talk about that when we return after this short break. You were saying, if this government borrows, the next will have to pay. And if the next borrows, 
the the government that uh, takes Absolutely. up after yes but then again uh, dr harsha de silva my question is what really went wrong during your five year period the coalition government led by the united national party which is known to have uh, uh, individuals who are highly knowledge and well read on economics like yourself and uh, then prime minister ranil wickremasinghe who you uh, are no longer with uh, but but what went wrong you know at no point am i going to question mr ranil wickremasinghe's abilities i mean you know my difference with him is purely political policy wise personally i mean i respect him the way i respected him then and i will continue to do so uh, in the future right so no need to bring that in right we are just politically different uh, for a perhaps a short while now the issue is we have to think about this country's future how are we going to take this country out of this hole we are in right since 1994 uh, this country was led by either a, a bandaranayaka or a rajapaksa and they were either slfp upfa or whatever it is what it is called now slpp right so that is where the 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 leadership was right so uh, ranil wickremasinghe yes was prime minister for a short period of time but the cabinet was headed by somebody else and the the the, the cabinet itself had uh, folks from uh, both sides now if you really go back and look at what uh, president jaya jawadan started in 77 Uh, and we proceeded along uh, you know that path we would have been far better off today unfortunately uh, we were unable to expand our markets we started looking inwards uh, we started uh, to think that you know we can do it by ourselves no we are still exporting what mr premadasa started the 200 garment factories he started now uh, in the 26 years of the slfp pa slpp rule what is the new industry that got created in this country when the competitors we had at that time thailand singapore korea they started producing complex products from uh, the 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 yester year they were producing simple products we are stuck here right so you got to open up you got to think big you got to figure out how are we going to capture bigger markets you can't think of building walls around this island and i hear it more and more now and i am i'm i'm really worried right as an economist more than a politician that we are going down the wrong path we don't need to build bridges or sorry uh, walls around this country what we need to do is to build bridges from this country are you are you referring to sri lanka looking inward in, uh, yes. when you say when you say uh, building walls around this island nation are you referring to the fact that we are looking at locally go- grown home grown uh, sri lankan only yes. uh, a protectionist policy absolutely but but at the same time sri lanka failed reaching out to uh, we 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 could not spur uh, economic growth based on our manufacturing industry uh, we we d- did not see our own products uh, as you you said our uh, export basket did not um, expand from uh, decades ago but government after government whether it's unp slf ppa uh, we failed to have policies that directed sri lanka to a more global market because we lacked policies so in this sense to individuals like you who are um, academically and professionally qualified are you all able to do enough to bring that policy consistency and to bring a policy direction to sri lanka regardless of what government is in power uh, th- that is really what i want to do uh, and you are spot on you know uh, hit the nail on the head by saying immaterial of who is in power we have to have a policy that is accepted right and we say look this is where we are going to go right look at economic history sri lanka was prosperous every time we connected with the global marketplace you know going back to the 12th century of parakrama bahu you know the king was a trader king you know there are so many stories about how he fought the uh, the king alaung situ of uh, of uh, burma myanmar uh, when he tried to put trade embargoes on uh, the trading of uh, of ivory of of uh, the 12th century Uh, Senrat Parnavitana has uh, written about it W A Vijayawardena former deputy governor has expanded on it there's so much written about it 
and how in Kalutara, uh, Sri Lanka had in the 12th century the f its first export processing zone. See, and then you know, and you exp you know, you start from there and look. Every time we were we were called an emporium. You know, people came to trade here. And if you look at the future in the next several uh, you know decades, uh, the growth is going to come from this part of the world, right? The Indian Ocean is going to be the key uh, where the literal st states uh, along the Indian Ocean will create wealth. And, and God has given us the absolutely perfect GPS, right? We are positioned in the right place. So if we are positioned in the right place, the world around us um, is going to grow. Should we go into a shell? Should we build a wall? Should we become protectionist? Or should we try to leverage what's happening around us? Should we try to grow with them? Should we not try to ride that wave? Think about it. So for the short term, for the gallery, for the just the pure political gain, people can say, look, we are going to be protectionists. We will grow our things. We will produce our things. That is not economically feasible to do. It is not sustainable in the medium term. One must think beyond short term politics. But during the f uh, five years that you were in government, did you all try to do all this that you're talking about? Absolutely. And that is why we were attempting to sign uh, trade agreements with, uh, say, Singapore and other countries. Highly that critical. Highly critical. Nevertheless, that is because of the political connotation. Right? It is not... Uh, an but your policy on uh, state institutions as well as uh, massive investments such as the Port City project in Sri Lanka have been criticized and uh, somehow... No, the Port power. City project uh, was criticized purely on two things. One is that Sri Lanka was not going to sell its land. And we stood by it. Mr. Rajapaksa's government agreed to sell 50 acres of that land, uh, sovereign rights to China. And we opposed it. And once we came, we, uh, we amended that agreement. And no longer has any land been sold outright to the Chinese uh, investor. So th isn't that wrong? It is the opposition to us, political opposition, who is in government now, who is accusing us of selling things. We actually didn't sell things. It was Mr. Rajapaksa who sold the 50 acres, right? So if you talk about that, you know, I will come back to you, you know, with all the, all the, all the evidence that I have. Uh, but the Port City project itself is moving along. The second issue was the environmental issue, right? Those have been resolved. And, and we want the Port City project uh, to grow. And we changed the original plan from having a racetrack there and a leisure park to a financial city. But and then again, um, uh, investments such as the Hambantota Port mm. and Maktala International Airport, those, uh, those were left stagnant during your time. No, it wasn't. In fact, because it was stagnant, the government went ahead and got into a different agreement, created a joint venture between China Merchant Company and the Port Authority of Sri Lanka. And now you see uh, the uh, China Merchant is uh, able to direct traffic uh, I I towards the Hambantota port. I it will take some time, but it will certainly create economic opportunity there. The industrial zone around that, which uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe uh, created or did the legislation to create, it's it takes time, you know, things don't happen overnight, uh, will certainly become a, a major industrial hub. And in order to expand our markets, we need to get access to the region and beyond. And that is why I personally was involved in getting GSP Plus back, you know, which the Rajapaksa government said it was not necessary and, and just left uh, lying. So with uh, these kinds of agreements, we get duty-free access to 28 countries in Europe to, for 6,600 products and so on and so forth. We need to get into what is called the RCEP, the Regional uh, Cooperative uh, uh, Re RCEP, which is the regional um, trade body, which uh, is, I think, like 16 countries from Australia to New Zealand to Singapore to Vietnam to Thailand and Japan and China, all those, right? Uh, so the, we, you got to you got to look outside. On that note, I think it's time to take a short break.
Park and I'm in discussion with Dr. Harsha De Silva, Colombo District candidate for the Samagi Jana Balavega. Um, Dr. Harsha De Silva, we've been talking a lot about the economy, your uh, perspective, uh, the time during which you were a key stakeholder of the government. Um, you did say Mr. Vikramasinghe should have given more time for his policies to be implemented and continued. But then again, you criticized the present uh, setup also, but it's very little time since uh, you know all these changes have taken place since you were in office. Now, the Samagit Jana Balavega wants to work with uh, President Gotabia Rajapaksa as the president. You believe you would be able to, uh, your candidate Sajid Premadasa will be able to work with him as uh, prime minister. How is this possible? I'll give you an example. You know, when I started um, uh, uh, working on my 1990 sewer area project, which some people uh, criticized then at the time, said I was trying to be a raw agent and so on and so forth not to get in my ambulances, they will get electrocuted and die. I didn't step back, I took them on and I created what is perhaps today, and I'm very proud about it, the 1,500 staff who work there. We have created the most efficient entity in Sri Lanka. We serve 21 million people every single day, 24 hours of the day, right? We save so many lives. Now when I resigned, from and also when you say I was a key stakeholder, please note I was never given a cabinet ministry, right? So I was never I never had that authority. I did everything having the highest position was a non cabinet ministry. Nevertheless, why, let, why, let, why, let, why would let, let me, why, why did they let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question. I wrote a letter to the president. I told him, Sir, I am resigning, right? And please take this thing under you. Because I, we created something uh, in Parliament, new legislation, uh, Act Number 18 of 2018. It's called the Suicide Foundation Act. And I told him, please take this under you. The President has been given the authority to appoint a board that runs it, uh, and therefore money comes separately, independently. I did it because I didn't want it to get messed up and you know get uh, you know uh, uh, what you call gridlock in the the normal public uh, you know the the bureaucratic system then i met him then he told me hasha what did you want me to do with uh, your project i said so don't if you're not take, going to take it under you let it be the way it is because we have put a plan uh, to take it forward we have a big uh, future uh, program for it, please let it be. And I must appreciate, he hasn't touched it. He has said it is a good thing, let it run. right? So that is an example that I am giving you uh, to prove that it is possible to work together if you have the same objective. The President is here to make sure that this country gets to where it needs but to your get. party had so much of differences with the president. Uh, no, the president, president is here to stay. He has one fair and square. He's got another four years and four months to go in his term of office, right? And uh, that I'm, is the I'm, I'm referring to uh, the previous setup. We are not worried about the previous setup. No, we are now we are in the f present and the future. Why do you want to go back? Beca because because we've seen that fail. No, that has failed. We all know that. It failed. We all know that. But how, I mean, it we, failed, how, how can it, it, people it, it, have it, faith and confidence no, in, in a similar setup going forward when it has been proven? No, uh, it has uh, not been proven. Mahaitri Pala Sirisena is not Gota Be Rajapaksa. Sajip Premdasa is not Ranil Vikramasinghe. These are two, uh, these are different individuals. Personalities are different. Objectives are different. We are talking of a, a, a possible working together because he is the president and that is the executive. This is the legislature. And under the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, the legislature has quite a lot of power. The Prime Minister yields a lot of power. Uh, it is not like during the 18th, uh, uh, with the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. So we will have to have a, a, a program a pre-agreed program between the president and the, uh, if we get elected, uh, the prime minister and the government of Mr. Premadasa, if that uh, it becomes reality. And then on that pre-agreed program, we implement it. 
that I mean there are so many countries that this has happened just because once you fail doesn't mean you're going to fail uh, every Mr. time. Mr. Sajid Premadasa and uh, Mr. Rana Wickramasinghe have failed to work out and iron out issues within the party itself. How do you expect a massive uh, burden and a responsibility as running a country, as uh, running the nation? We'll, we'll be able to, uh, we, uh, that, that Mr. Mr. Sajid Premadasa will be able to do that. Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa and Mr. Maitri Palasirisena also couldn't find agreement. And, and therefore, uh, we, we saw a change in government. We saw, uh, you did criticize back then, you did say, which is why uh, they lost, which is why they could not move forward. So we see these things happen in history. So how do So, so are you saying only the Rajapaksas are able to sort matters out? That the Premadasas are not able to, that we are not good enough, that we, we, are, we somehow... Not. Certainly <laughs> not. What I'm trying to say here is yeah. that the SLPP, now they're contesting under one banner, SLFP and uh, the SLPP have come together. Yeah. Here the UNP is divided. UNP uh, did not, was not divided back in the day when you set up the government of good governance yeah. with the support of uh, the SLFP. But 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 it's now an, uh, it's it's different. Yeah, it, Here the party itself is divided. Yeah. Uh, your prime minister pa pa back then. Party is when you say divided, it sends out the wrong message. The uh, absolute uh, bulk of the UNP is with Sajid. Right? We can see. We will see that at the end of the the election. I am not going to criticize the UNP or its leadership. That's not why I'm here to do. What I'm here to do is to tell you that if to answer your question. Uh, Saji Premadasa is elected, uh, whether he is going to be able to work with the President Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa and I am saying yes and I gave you one little example to show that it can be done, it has been done and it will continue to happen, right? Because uh, you know like you said, we have to have policy consistency, right? And, and Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa had said previously, you know, I want to move away from the, the, the pure politics. Right? I want to have more professionals in office. I want to be different. That is what we also say. We also saying let's move away from you know the petty politics, uh, the retail politics. You know just to win votes for you know for tomorrow. That is the reason why this country is in such a state. Now let's move above that. Let us stop the criticism and let us figure out what we need to do as a nation. Let us all fix Sri Lanka together. And that is what I'm saying. And we are professionals, right? We have come to uh, politics, you know, and getting all this, you know, uh, you know, facing all these difficulties in this job. But why am I doing this? Because I have a dream for this country. I know that this country can be fixed, right? And I know that, uh, you know, I bring a lot of uh, professional expertise, experience, global uh, uh, sort of uh, knowledge and I have done something, I have delivered something. Do you have faith that the system will value what the input you give? I mean it is up to the people. I believe people will vote with their heads, right? You know I don't do your typical politics, right? I don't have a single post. I don't see I have a single cutout hanging uh, on a lamp post. I don't. I don't do that. I expect people to think... But shouldn't, in that case, shouldn't the system itself uh, need to be changed? Yeah, I think the system is changing. I believe the system is changing. I believe the young people are no longer interested in Kapuat Kolo or Kapuat Nil. They're looking for people with ideas. They're looking for people who, who are knowledgeable. They're looking for people who have delivered. And I am telling the people of Colombo, here is somebody who you can uh, look at in your set of options. Thank you for joining us at Hyde Park. Thank you very much. We had with us uh, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, former Deputy Minister of Policy Planning and Economic Development, former Non-Cabinet Minister of Economic Reforms and Public Distribution. He was also former State Minister of National Policies and Economic Affairs. Now the Colombo District candidate for the Samagijana Balavegia, Dr. Harshad Thank you for joining us at Hyde Park.